This is Exodus 33. Then the Lord said to Moses, Leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt, and go up to the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hevites, and the Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey. But I will not go with you, because you're a stiff-necked people, and I might destroy you on the way. When the Lord heard these, sorry, when the people heard these distressing words, they began to mourn, and no one put on any ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, tell the Israelites, you're a stiff-necked people. If I were to go with you, even for a moment, I might destroy you. Now take off your ornaments, and I will decide what to do with you. So the Israelites stripped off their ornaments at Mount Horeb. Now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrances to their tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and worshipped, each at the entrance to his or her tent. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young assistant Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. Moses said to the Lord, you've been telling me, lead these people, but you've not let me know whom you will send with me. You've said, I know you by name, and you've found favor with me. If you're pleased with me, teach me your ways so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked, because I'm pleased with you, and I know you by name. Then Moses said, Now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. This morning, we're kicking off, uh, as I said, our um, annual vision series. So we do this every year at the start of a new term. Our vision here at St. Philip's is to pursue God until heaven overflows through us. I know that for some of us, that's a journey of discovering what that means. I'm excited to go on that journey with you. If you're new to St. Philip's today, there are important aspects of our vision that I'm not going to cover today. I don't have time because we sang for the length of a Bible there, but um, we, which is lovely. I didn't want to stop down. I didn't want to preach. I was going to actually kill the preach. Um, but uh, I want you to do me a favor if you're new today. Would you pick up one of our welcome packs on the way out? Someone from the home team will give you one. And in that welcome pack, you'll find a little, uh, amongst other things, a little card with a QR code. That will take you to last year's vision series where I, I, dig, I, I dug, digged, dug a bit deeper into the vision. So you can scan that QR code. It will take you to those services, which were online services. You can skip the first 40 minutes and hit the sermons if you'd like to know more. So pick one of those up in the lobby on the way out. I think I've told you guys, haven't I, as a church, the origin of our vision statement? The first September that I arrived here, two years ago, believe it or not, global pandemic in the middle there somewhere, um, I had a, a really significant encounter with Jesus. Uh, he manifested in front of me, and... Um, he reached into my chest and took a hold of my heart and pulled my heart towards him. Uh, very intense, very powerful encounter. Um, everything about that moment was an invitation to make Jesus the main thing. I mean, I've been a Christian since I was five, but that was a significant moment. My whole heart for him, undivided, unconflicted, 
my first love. And as Jesus pulled my heart towards him in the spirit, two things happened. In the physical, I felt my heart press against my ribcage. Isn't that weird? And the second thing was he said to me, pursue God until heaven overflows through you, through us. It was the moment he gave the vision statement. Every thought captive, every desire aligned, every affection poured out on him, every moment aware of his presence, every decision, every problem, every conflict, every heartache submitted to his sovereignty. It's about resolving to put him first. Not church first, not ministry or mission first, not good works first, not our problems first, not anything. Nothing is of more importance than Him. Nothing is more precious than His presence. Does that make sense? I don't know how else to explain it other than saying it's all about Him. (laughs) He's the most important There is nothing more precious than his presence. But I'm going to try over the coming weeks, over the next five weeks, we're going to explore different aspects of what this vision means. It has two concepts, our vision statement, the pursuit of God and then the overflow of that pursuit. What happens in us and through us when we make Jesus everything? It's a deeply missional vision, but it is very clear that any overflow that comes out of us personally and corporately has to come out of the pursuit, nothing else. The two parts of this vision statement are very, very connected. The first part is the primary calling on our lives. The second part is the byproduct of that calling. If we want to impact those around us with the gospel of Jesus, then we must pursue God first. And I find it fascinating. This is not, I'm I'm not judging it because I've been like this my whole life, but I literally find it fascinating that so many Christians seem to do it the other way around. They do mission to worship God. They say things like, I worship God by serving. I'm really convinced that's the wrong way around. We're meant to worship God, not by what we do for God, but by actually worshiping Him. The doing is what's meant to follow, and there's loads of doing. Brilliant. Love the doing. The problem, though, is that the doing may sound good and look good and feel good. It may be exactly what you think church should look like, and in that sense, guys, it's very, very seductive. But it's most certainly not, I think, what God wants church to look like. He's not impressed with works. He doesn't want our striving. He is actually opposed to the flesh. He says in Hosea 6.6, I don't want your sacrifices. I want your hearts. I don't want the doing. I want your love. Which means that we have to kill any love affair that we have with the flesh and rediscover our first love, Jesus. And the beautiful truth is that when we go after him, heaven responds. The spirit draws near and the presence manifests. Talked about it a bit last week. So our vision here is about communing so intimately with the Holy Spirit that we become saturated in the atmosphere of heaven so that the realities of heaven's culture begin to manifest around us until heaven's culture through us overwhelms the pathetic culture of the world that is full of deceit and despair and hopelessness and judgmentalism and misery, etc. Am I making sense? I mean that God has power for us to make heaven a reality here. On earth, as it is in heaven, is literally the Father's heartbeat. And the crazy thing, I was getting whacked in that worship. Faultless I stand before the throne. The blood of Christ has made it possible for us to release healing where there is illness, hope where there is despair. We get to release prosperity where there is poverty, relational restoration where there is breakdown, and there's loads of it out there and in here. Justice 
where there is injustice. It's heaven on earth. It's the commission. It all flows from the pursuit of God's presence. You might remember from the last vision series that our vision statement is supported by three Bs, which came from Harry Cook. I love them. Behold, belong, and become. We're going to look at those three Bs over the next three weeks, or at least aspects of them. Today, I want to talk about behold. This is what our soon-to-be-launched new website, hopefully this month, says, Behold, our primary desire, primary, our main focus, is that we would behold, in other words, experience and become familiar with the manifest, in other words, the actual and real glory of God. We believe that God created us to enjoy a life of deep intimacy with Him. I've talked about that before. Intimacy is the doorway to encounter. We are passionate about His presence. We know that all sorts of cool things happen when the atmosphere of heaven fills a room. In other words, God actually does stuff when He rocks up. Who has experienced the manifest glory of God entering a room? Show me your hands. Who was here at Kingdom Come that first six months when I was here? Look, you see, there's a hand going up there that couldn't go up before that night because the Lord walked into the room and healed Adrian's shoulder without us even praying for him. All right, you can put it down now, Adrian. No one likes a show off. No one likes a show off just because you're his favorite. That's what happens when the manifest presence of God comes into a room. We went after him for two hours and he rocked up. Our primary desire is that we would behold the manifest glory of God. Last week, um, I asked you whether your life was defined by a desire for God. This morning, I want to continue that conversation just as I think about priorities. I want to encourage you this year to do whatever you have to do, reboot whatever you have to reboot, and put down whatever you have to put down to live your life with one single priority the pursuit of the manifest presence of God. And this morning, I want to offer you just three how-tos, three ways that you can prioritize the presence of God, the first part of our vision statement. Key to understanding Exodus 33 is Moses' desire for the presence of God. The emphasis he placed on encountering the manifest presence of God is central to Exodus 33. Bear that in mind as we look at these how-tos. So the first how-to, you prioritize the pursuit of God by prioritizing the presence of God. Take a look at verse 3 of our reading today. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you. God's saying you can have everything you want. You can have every promise I've ever made to you. You just can't have me. It's a remarkable moment of mercy, because you know they've just done the whole golden calf thing, if you're familiar with the story. It's a remarkable moment of mercy, but it's mercy, but it's also a very dangerous moment. The seductive fulfillment of what the people want. It's good. It's even of God. It's everything that he's prepared for them. It's a thriving church. It's an active ministry. It's mission partners. It's great social events. It's awesome pantos in January. It's good standing in the community. It's church growth. It's just not him. Verse 15, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. I love that verse, and that's the verse for this year, guys. If you aren't present, God, I don't want it, is what Moses said to the living God who's just put everything on a plate for him. Moses never lost sight of the main thing. His priority was the presence. But Paul, how can I do that when my life is so busy? It's easy for you. You're a vicar. All the time in the world to chase after God. You're even paid to do it is what one friend actually said to me once. (laughs) That's if. Although, frankly, if that is your opinion, just get ordained and get on with it. 
Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If you want to discover what your priorities are, look at what you spend most time on or check your bank balance. It never lies. What you spend, coffees did you say? Yeah, I spend a lot of money on coffee. <laughs> Pretty accurate measures of where your heart lies. All of us have multiple pulls on our time. That's the reality of life. Some of you will be very focused on your kids right now as they go up for the first time to secondary school. Many of you will have other extremely pressing issues within your families. I know that some of you have recently suffered bereavement. Some of you look after aging parents. For others, it might be health, relationships, work. There will be many other examples. And what we have to do, we have to compartmentalize, don't we? Otherwise, we'll go nuts. We have to prioritize. I am a massive list writer. I cannot get through each day without three things, the Lord, Jules, and a list. And um, someone in the congregation who knows this gave me this last week. How lovely, what a gift. Inside, that was Friday. Inside, there's a whole place for a list of to-dos. Can you see that? And there's a little box of gold, and there's even a little box called priorities. It's already saved my life. You want one? Yeah, well, you can have this one. <laughs> but it got me thinking, have you ever noticed how we talk about priority in the plural? Very rarely do we say, what is my priority? We say, what are my priorities? But it's actually a misunderstanding of the word. The word priority comes from the same Latin root as prime. It means first or most important. In other words, priority is singular. Pretty much uh, ever since Benji has been able to speak, he has loved asking a very specific question. Daddy, what's your favorite? It could be color. It could be vegetable, food, car, sports team. It's become a bit of a joke in our family because even after years and years and years, he still reverts to that question. When he's happy, when he's bored, when he's feeling philosophical, when he has nothing else to say, Benji will be heard just to randomly say, Daddy, what's your favorite? And it does get random. Last month, we're walking down the street. Daddy, yes, Benji, what's your favorite tooth? <laughs> How random is that? Incisor, it's gotta be the incisor, ridiculous. But even after all the practice, Benji still, yeah, totally right with the incisor. Thank you, dentist, dentist, canine. Very partial to a premolar myself. Um, <laughs> But you know, even after all the practice, Benji, bless him, uh, still doesn't really get what it means to have a favorite because when I answer him with one thing, he always then asks about other examples. Daddy, what's your favorite color? It's blue, Benji. But what about orange and yellow? Don't you like them, Daddy? I do like them, Benji, but you asked for my favorite and my favorite is blue. What's your favorite, Benji? Blue, orange, and yellow. And so it goes on. When Benji talks about favorites, he always talks in the plural. When we talk about priorities, we are thinking in the plural. That's a problem in my opinion. I do it all the time because priorities are always a matter of the heart. It's always about the heart. It's not about time. We think prioritizing is about dividing our attention, but what we're actually doing is dividing our affection. It's about the heart. Priorities always divide affection. In verse 14 of chapter 34 of Exodus, the chapter straight after our reading today, we read that God is a jealous God. Do you know what that means? It means he doesn't belong on a list. He's above every other list that's ever been written. In fact, when he's placed on a list, he doesn't tend to hang around. Go up to the land of milk and honey, but I am not going to go with you. We may achieve a lot. We may have everything that we want in the physical, but we don't, won't have the one thing that we were created for, his presence. That's what we're created for. Read Genesis and then Revelation. And if you like everything in between, we are created to enjoy the presence of God. Such a shame that Christians are satisfied with good theology instead. What a low goal that is when you can have the manifest presence of the living God. God does not belong on a list. 
You prioritize the pursuit of God by prioritizing the presence of God. Second how to make space for encounter. Take a look at verse 11. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Moses so prioritized the actual presence of God that he created a space for encounter. Verse 7, Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. This tent was like the sort of physical representation of the priority of Moses' heart. Into the tent he would go, leaving everything behind for encounter. If you think your life is busy, I read um, biblical scholars think that he brought six million people out of Exodus. That's quite an undertaking, isn't it? You know, there's 120 of you guys, and I'm cracking up. It's just a big endeavor to organize. And yet he remains focused on one thing. Note what verse 7 says, though. I love this. Moses would go outside the camp to meet with God. Can you see the significance of that? Outside the camp. Corporate worship is a significant context for encountering the presence of God. We've just been doing it right now in worship, pressing in. I love it. I'll talk about it in a minute. But we have to go after God individually. All encounter starts on the one-to-one, the secret place, spirit to spirit. I have a friend called Debs who's wonderful. She's taught me a load of stuff about going after the presence of God. She has created a space in her home. It's an armchair in a corner of her sort of dining kitchen area by her French doors. No matter how busy her day is, she will go to the armchair to meet with God. She's created a place of encounter. And she's a very busy woman. Teenage kids, her own business. She started a charity. She mentors young adults. She gives a day a week to the church. She has family in England, Scotland, and California. She is busy. And yet every day to her armchair of meeting she goes. And there she honors the presence of God. You should see it. It's a little bit shriny, but it's awesome. (laughs) Bibles, journals, books, a cross, an owl. We bought her a wooden owl to honor the way that she's gone after wisdom and the prophetic. It's her tent of meeting. She goes outside the camp. She seeks God's face, and the Lord speaks to her like a man speaks with his friend. We are literally all very busy. We all have to return to the camp. The calling on Moses' life must have been overwhelming, but it's through his decision to prioritize the presence that he becomes a nation's deliverer. It all flowed out of personal encounter. This year, if you don't have one already, I would love to encourage you to make a place for encounter. If you don't have a physical space where you habitually go out of the camp to meet with the Lord, try it. Pitch your tent of meeting. Camp around the glory. Learn to honor the presence of the Holy Spirit. How do you do that? Just start easy. Read the Gospels. Sit and read the Gospels and make a note of how preoccupied Jesus was with encountering his Father. Watch what he did before his miracles. Or read books. I've got loads of books. Bill Johnson, Hosting the Presence. John Bevere, Drawing Near, Both Have Changed My Life. Jack Frost, Embracing, Experiencing the Father's Embrace. Lots of people have trouble encountering God because they don't trust that He's a good Father. That often happens when we've had unhelpful models of fatherhood in our lives. Brilliant book. It'll open a new realm of encounter for you. If you want them, I'll buy you one. Just let me know. Prioritize the pursuit of God by prioritizing the presence. Make space for personal encounter. Finally, get active in corporate encounter. Look at verse 8 of Exodus 33. Whenever Moses went out to the tent of meeting, all the people rose and stood at the entrance to their tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. As Moses went into the tent, 
the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and worshipped. Now look at verse 11. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young assistant Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. Verse 7, all the people worship the whole time Moses is meeting with God. Verse 11, Moses is in the habit of encountering the presence of God with one other, Joshua. What's the point? The point is that the pursuit of God starts with going outside the camp, but it's never separate from the corporate context. The people in Joshua, they're doing the same thing. They turn their faces to the presence of God and they worship Him. Joshua remains in the tent, the place of presence. In both cases, they're prioritizing and honoring the manifest presence of God. Moses' personal encounter is in the context of corporate encounter. So how can you make that a feature of your discipleship this year? First, be a Joshua, and find someone who is more intimate with God than you. That's what discipleship is. I have a friend who is way more intimate with God than me, way more mature in his faith, and he has taught me so much. I don't want to be him, but I want the mantle that he carries. I've watched him. I've worshipped with him. I've prayed with him. He's given me vocabulary that has opened up encounter for me. He's taught me how to rest in the presence of God, to be still in his presence. I listen to who he listens to. I read the books that he's reading, and I have honored his desire for God so that it would manifest in my life the same desire. Be a Joshua and find a Moses. Second, just get involved. Get involved in the many ways that we're going after the presence here at St. Philip's, especially now that restrictions have been lifted. Join us again at the evening services, starting on the 19th of this month. We're going to go after encounter. You will be delighted to hear that the talks are going to be really short. We're going to focus on the presence. We're going to camp around the presence, not the sermons. 6.30. Come to Kingdom Come on the 15th here in church. Like I said, two hours of unhindered worship. We're going to be doing them once a term. Can't wait. Tuesday morning prayer meeting here in the church, now in person, no longer on Zoom. Not ideal for everybody that time of the day, but that prayer meeting, I feel, over the last 18 months has become a little hot coal of prophetic intercession. We've spent the last six months praying for revival. I'm excited to see where God calls us next. I have a funny feeling it's going to be to pray for revival. The 24-7 prayer room, who got involved in that before lockdown? We're going to reopen it this month. Tim does not know that yet. <laughs> We're going to get it open. Book an hour of prayer. There'll be loads of resources in there to help you do it. Come with your home group. Come on your own. Come with your prayer triplet. Come to half nights of worship and prayer that we're going to do, Jay. Get involved. Abide. Who logged into Abide during lockdown? Abide were online sessions on Zoom where we just did um, spontaneous worship and focused on our calling to abide in the vine, what it means to abide in the vine. I feel like the Lord's spoken to us a little bit on that. We're going to have some abide sessions this year where we're going to sit in silence and practice the quiet place. Get involved in that. And finally, home groups. I'll be speaking about this more next week because we're going to look at our second B, belong. But um, we've just finished some training for home group leaders. We're bringing home groups to the center of life at St. Philip's. Home groups will be our discipleship program. I know no better context to grow in the gifts of the Spirit, in the prophetic, in healing, and in faith than in the context of a home group. There's so many opportunities for us to corporately go after the presence together this year. Why? 
because he deserves it. But also, we want to be a people that overflow from the fullness of the presence of God in us. Prioritize the presence, make space for personal encounter, get active in corporate encounter. Exodus 33 teaches us so much about the pursuit of the presence of God. But get this, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful, and the one who promised wants you to walk through the cross into his presence. My prayer for us this term, as we press into the God, the things that God has for us, is that we would just respond to that invitation. That for each one of us, he would reach in and take hold of our hearts and pull them towards him.